Well, hello and good evening and welcome. Um, we're going we're gonna to get started. You don't have to applaud that, but thank you. <laughs> um, this is really a special evening, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And so um, I know some more people will filter in. It's the usual DC rush hour and parking dilemma. Um, so just a couple words, a couple things by way of introduction. Um, first off, you're in the museum's innovation wing. And so you're surrounded by exhibits that opened in 2015 themed to the issue of invention and innovation. And it's part of a larger scale renovation going on in the museum, starting with this floor. Last year, we just opened the second floor exhibits on democracy and immigration. So how the nation was formed, how it came together, and the expansion of the voting franchise. And it's quite interesting to think about the relationship of the innovation, the technology that's featured on this floor, and how it's interplayed with the growth of the United States economically, but also shifts and changes in our political system. Um, next year, and actually starting, uh, yeah, starting in about six months, we're going to be renovating and reopening the third floor around entertainment, sports, and popular culture. And so you'll see that over time, this museum is really going through a significant transformation in how we present to the public American history and how people are involved in shaping and, and changing American history. Um, I want to introduce also the Lemelson Center. So I'm Arthur Demrich, director of the Lemelson Center. We're the host of tonight's program and the Innovative Lives series. Um, this is the third out of six we're doing this spring, and we're especially delighted um, at what we're doing tonight for reasons that you'll hear in just a minute. The Lemelson Center was founded to use history to inspire and engage a new generation of inventors. And so our, our goal is really to engage, educate, and empower people. We engage them with our exhibits, with our programs like tonight. We educate them in a place like Spark Lab, which you'll see during the reception, a hands-on invention space. And we really want to empower people in a program like tonight's to think of themselves as inventive. How can I, too, change the world? Um, not everyone gets to be an inventor, the way you'll hear from Andy Hildebrand, but we all can be inventive in our daily lives. And that's really something we aim to bring through these. Um, these programs really try to bring an audience face to face with an inventor and innovation leader. They will speak about their breakthroughs, talk about challenges, and how they overcame them. So tonight's program, I also want to announce, is the second of what is now an annual David H. Horowitz Music Innovation Program. Um, and the H is important because there's another David Horowitz who's a uh, right-wing commentator on the news regularly. And I just want to make clear this was not the same David Horowitz. This David was a pioneer who really changed how we listen and watch music, an innovator in the entertainment industry more generally. His career began in law, but by the early 1960s had shifted to media and entertainment in his work with Columbia Pictures. After a move to Warner Communications, he took over their cable television and pushed the company into programming, which, by the way, sounds a little bit like what a company called Netflix has done. So, you know, Netflix isn't the first at, at following this path. And then, together with Bob Pittman, he took the risk of launching an advertising-based 24-hour music video channel that some of you may have heard of called MTV. And if you grew up in the 1980s, that was sort of the defining uh, imagery and sounds of your childhood, so really significant. Um, he went on to become an early stage investor in the emerging internet economy and even went on to rescue Spin Magazine, which some of you may have heard of as well. Um, in conversations with his children, and I'm very pleased that uh, Roger is here tonight, um, so it's, it's really clear that his passion for innovation was matched only by the love and patronage of music. So we're really delighted to have that support. So now the third thing I want to do by way of introduction is introduce Trevor Pinch, who will be leading the discussion with Andy Hildebrand. So Professor Pinch is really a renowned professor of science and technology studies and really a pioneer of a radical new way of examining and writing about technology and society starting in the 1970s. Along with a small group of other leading edge scholars in Britain and the United States, he led the way in thinking about technology as socially constructed. That is not just proceeding under an inherent self-logic, but through human decisions, human agency, good and bad. Not resting on his laurels, he pioneered a field of research called sound studies. He started that with a biography of Robert Moog, 
the synthesizer producer, and has gone on to a number of other research projects in that line. Um, and when not teaching or jamming with his band, he's continued the analysis of music technology. And last, I can't help but add that Trevor was on my PhD committee, and so it's rare that one gets to introduce one's PhD professor, but Trevor, we're really delighted to have you here. Thank you for coming down and doing this. So please come on up. I'd like you to welcome uh, our guest, our in inventor, innovator, Andy Hildebrand. Please see. Yeah. So how we intend to run this, um, we'll talk together. This is supposed to be a, apparently a fireside chat, which I think is very applicable for the so-called spring we've been having. Um, we'll, we'll talk together for about 40 minutes, and then we'll throw it open to questions from you all. So please get your questions ready. Um, so Andy Hildebrand, until very recently, was the CEO and chief scientist of a company called Antares. He's just retired. And he's, he and his wife, who's sitting there, told me they were living in Puerto Rico now. They moved to retirement in Puerto Rico. Um, now, he's most famous for the invention of a technology which you've probably heard of called Auto-Tune, which is a, tech a music technology you'll find in every studio in the world. It's a revolutionary technology. And it's basically, its main use, and I think it was designed for, and Andy will correct me on this, was for tuning the voices of out-of-tune singers. So you can correct the pitch of a singer to make it blendlessly, se s seamlessly m be with the music. And of course, the voice, as we know, is where so much emotion is. There's nothing worse than an out-of-tune voice for destroying a recording. So this is an incredible invention. And um, uh, also, an extension of this, people who, people who get technology tend to want to use it in their own ways. And people start to retune auto-tune and use it for other purposes. Now, many of you will recall a record by Shear in the late 90s called Believe with a particular vocal sound on it. Mm -hmm. And that vocal sound, I do believe, was produced by one of the first uses of auto-tune. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was a time, I remember, with my daughter sitting in the car, where every song you'd listen to, and she's into pop music, had some sort of weird rapper's voice that had been auto-tuned with some strange, it sounded like a sort of mechanical voice, which was, after a while, I mean, first of all, it was innovative, but then it got a bit tiresome, I think, those voices. <laughs> Isn't that right? <laughs> anyway, I, we'll get to, I, we'll get to uh, order two. I want to defend myself about that. Uh. <laughs> I explain to people, uh. Uh, I just build a car. I don't drive it down the wrong side of the freeway. <laughs> Very good. So I just want to walk um, Andy, and if you, for your benefit, a little bit through his career. An amazing career, very interesting career he's had as an inventor. He was born in Cor Coronado. I'm a Brit. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Coronado. Coronado California, in 1946. And he did his undergraduate degree at Michigan State in 1965 to 9 in systems science. Um, and then he actually uh, moved to Washington, D.C., I believe, mm -hmm. to work for the Naval Engineering Center, where he worked on inertial design of navigation inertial navigation, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, he did his PhD in 1976 out in Urbana, Champaign, Urbana. I always think of that as a university in the cornfields, <laughs> University of Illinois, Urbana. And um, his dissertation, this is fascinating, I hope he'll talk a bit more about this in, in a minute or two, was estimating density of weevil populations in alfalfa fields. Now, isn't yes. that... Um, Unbelievable that yeah. you could get from that to water tunes. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to tell us how to do this. So everyone should immediately go out and study alfalfa and weevils. This is <laughs> um, uh, so he then, uh, having been at grad school, he then worked for Exxon for a big period of time. And um, he was basically formed his own geological consulting company doing seismic analysis. And I have a quote here how difficult this is. Somebody said, 
It's like listening to a lightning bolt trying to figure out the shape of the clouds. I don't know if this is an accurate thing, but trying to work out from seismic analysis where exactly the geological shape and where, where oil resources are in particular is very, very important. He's made lots of innovations in this area. In 1982, he formed a company called Landmark Graphics, which is basically computational solutions for seismic predictions. And here the key thing seems to be that these complicated seismic predictions could all be done on a PC workstation. And this is the time of the OPEC oil crisis. And this enabled many geologists to find oil that hadn't been found before, if I've got this correct. Mm -hmm. And this has come, this, your, your, basically your software has become the industry standard in geological surveying. Mm -hmm. um, now here's an interesting twist to his career. 1989, I hope you're following this, he left geophysics to study composition at Rice University. Now music, this turns music out... Music composition. Computer, sorry, computer composition. Com music composition. Mu music composition, yeah, music composition. Um, and this turns out to be a theme in your career that you've always had an interest in music. You were rec recorded as a, a studio musician at age, was it 16 or 18? Yes, 16. Age 16 as a flautist. So he's always had this interest in music. And this reminds me of Robert Moog, who was not a professional musician, but in his invention of the synthesizer, always had this particular interest in music that went throughout his career. Um, and then, of course, we get to Antares and Autotune. And um, so let, let me just start off by asking you, is Autotune the invention you're proudest of, of all the many inventions you've had? Um, yes, it is. Um, it, it's uh, it created a very successful company. Yeah. It's a small company. Uh, the entire company is nine people. And um, we uh, developed a lot of notoriety, and people felt good about working there. And we had a very small, tightly knit community where uh, we were all very proud of the work we did. It's just based outside of Silicon Valley, somewhere like that in California. Is that where? That it's uh, it's close. It's at, uh, close to uh, Santa Cruz, California, which is between, which is just south of San Jose. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a story kicking around about the origins of Autotune, which may be one of these stories that isn't true, but I have to ask you about it. So the story is that the, the wife of an entire, the, the, the salesman Antares, wife was a singer, mm -hmm. and this salesman asked you, could you invent a technology so my wife could sing in tune, a box that would do this? And this Close. was at the time considered an impossible thing to do to tune a voice. Yes. And is that, is, that, is that story true? Is that okay. For, let me put this in a context. I mean, it was, it was a desire that everyone had and many people had attempted to do and no one was able to do this very well. I didn't understand any of that. Uh, I had a, a luncheon at a trade show with my distributor, a couple, a couple partners, and my distributor's wife. And uh, we were talking about, well, what project do we do next to make money? Making money is important, right? Um, and she says, well, why don't you make me a box where I could sing in tune? Huh. And I looked around the table, and everybody kind of stared at their meal. <laughs> I said, well, that's a lousy idea, so I didn't do a thing. <laughs> I went on to do some other project, and then about eight months later, I, I thought, well, you know, I don't have anything to do. What do I do? That might actually be a good idea, and I knew exactly how to do it because of my geophysical technologies. And um, so by the same trade show, 12 months later, I had, uh, I had it, the automatic mode completely implemented. And I could demonstrate it with a live singer. It worked in real time. And uh, I had producers demanding to have a copyright. And I said, it's not done. I have a graphical mode to do. But, uh, and, uh, but I made a couple of them beta testers, and they were happy with that. So uh, it was immediately successful. Every, within a year, every major studio had it. And they were using it on a lot of music. Right, yeah. And then Cher came out. <laughs> yeah. So it was actually being used for the purpose of keeping singers in tune. Right, yeah. 
And uh, can I take a moment and... Please, please, okay. it's your floor. So there's songs that are slow, like a ballad, long notes. And there's songs that are fast, like, you know, a rap kind of song. And you, you, want, you, you want to correct the pitch on a rap song pretty quickly. But you don't want to correct the pitch that quickly on a slow ballad. It will sound weird. So there's a dial on the interface that is the amount of milliseconds to get halfway to the scale pitch. So you turn it to a slow setting for a ballad. You turn it to a faster setting for a rap artist or someone who's singing a faster song. So just for the heck of it, I said, I'll let it go to zero. And that makes this instantaneous change in pitch. And that's the effect that Cher used. That's the same one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so driving the instrument to zero, turning that thing to zero. Mm -hmm. And when you, when, you, when you realized that you could do it, did you think it would ever take off, that you would be... You I know? didn't think anybody would ever use that feature. <laughs> <laughs> like, why would you want to do that? <laughs> it sounds strange. <laughs> yeah. But it was a nice technology, because it let the users do that, right? So it yes. let them do it. Because mm -hmm. if they hadn't, if it, it was somehow constrained it, this is one of the big debates in... in, in you know, designing musical instruments, how much constraint should you put on the, mm -hmm. what the user can do? And so mm -hmm. you had the freedom there, and Moog had this freedom as well in his inventions that would allow the user to use the thing in a way he hadn't ever expected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that leads to the user being creative as well. And this is, seems to be a classic example of this. So let me just ask you, when you go back to your childhood, um, did you expect to... You know, as a, as a kid, do you dream of uh, inventing a musical technology like auto-tune or anything else musical? Oh, no, no. I, uh, I didn't do very well at school. Ah, ah that's interesting. Uh, I failed the first grade. Ah. Wow. <laughs> and then... <laughs> I know her. <laughs> So you would and say that, a good example to your kids. Yeah, yeah and I had, I had, I, it turns out I'm ADHD, and I, I just couldn't pay attention. So I had two kinds of teachers. Most of them put me in a seat in the back of the class, and I just looked out at the clouds. <laughs> and then some of, the, some of them put me right in the front. And when my attention wandered, they would slap a ruler across my hand. This is, this is a parochial school. Oh. Um, but... Um, yeah, I, I, I wasn't very successful in school until I uh, went to junior high school, and then I made my first C. <laughs> I'm going to tell my kids that. <laughs> and then, uh, but it, I got better, and, uh, and, and I got interested in science, and, yeah. and I had, in the meantime, I was learning to focus my attention because I was playing music like four or five hours a day. Yeah. And, um, was that the flute? What, yes. What, what, yeah. Mm -hmm. When did you discover the, the flute? I thought those... uh, age, age 12. Right. Mm -hmm. Did you do recorder before and then move to flute? We just went straight to the flute? And... Yeah, just the flute, yeah. Wow, yeah. And uh, my, my mother saw the potential in the ins my playing the instrument, mm -hmm. so she, she helped me by giving me private lessons and right. such. And um, she's 95 just a few months ago. Um, so, so I began to focus better in high school. I started making B's and A's, and that barely got me into college. And then I did the, my system science degree is electrical engineering plus some economics and other things, and fluid mechanics and thermodynamics. And it was a pretty interesting curriculum. But, um, yeah. but I, I, I got straight A's in college, and... Um, that enabled me to go to graduate school later. Right, right. So th this interest in music, I mean, was it a tension for you always throughout your career that uh, maybe I could become a professional because you were recording in the studio at age 16? Did, mm -hmm. did you think you could become a professional musician? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's kind of a tension in your life that you always well, and thought then, And then I, I began thinking about all my flute teachers and how poor they were. <laughs> <laughs> you did say making money was important, yeah. <laughs> so uh, so that, that swayed my decision away from being a performing musician yeah. uh, for a career. And, um, so you, did you keep it up? Were you always practicing? And I, I played actively through about age 40, and then I had some orthodonture. 
Ah. And that was the end of it. <laughs> All right. That's pretty crucial for the flute, I guess. Yeah. 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 So um, one of the questions we like to ask our inventors is, did you have a favorite plaything as a child? The flute, yeah. The flute was your favorite mm -hmm. plaything. Mm -hmm. um, a younger age, because you said flute, you started really at 12. Was a, at a younger age, was there something else? I played with a lot of mud. <laughs> ah, this is the geological <laughs> link. There you go. <laughs> Paid to see yeah, so I, you know, having attention deficit oh. uh, problems, I, I had trouble making eye contact with people, and I was always one, the last one to be picked for the baseball team, and right, and uh, didn't socialize well. Yeah. Oh. Uh, but, <laughs> I mean, when you reflect on your successful career and you reflect to these moments of, I mean, is there a, is there a message for kids of today from this? You wouldn't, you know, you well, wouldn't particularly Well, I, I, would, I would like to address that, yeah. Uh, ADHD is mislabeled. It's not attention deficit disorder. It's not a deficit of attention. It's an inability to control attention. Right. You give an ADHD kid a video game, and they're glued to it, full attention. Uh, so uh, to manage... Being ADHD, you have to understand, you have to come to a personal understanding that you can't control it. You can turn it on and off. Right. Yeah, and does, does, do, does that lead, do you think there's some advantage in, in even becoming an inventor and being ADHD? I, th I think so, because most inventors oh. are. Yeah, and certainly... Robert Moog is the inventor I know best. I wouldn't know if he formally had that condition, but he had this ability to sort of focus in on something and then mm -hmm. you'd sort of wonder where he was and then sort of lose contact with you. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So that could be an Certainly advantage. Edison was, a, was ADHD. Einstein was ADHD. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a dissertation in this, I think. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Always the professor. <laughs> Um, now, was there anybody, um, sometimes an inventor has a particular mentor or it can be a teacher or even parent or somebody who, you know, helps them and shows them a way. Did you have a mentor? Is there, was there somebody like... I had more, I had more role models yeah. than mentors. I kind of generalized a mentor. I didn't have a specific individual uh, that I would call um, my mentor, but I would, I would draw from... Uh, people's skills, my teachers, my music teachers, and uh, thesis professors, and, right. and associates who knew more about the world than I did, and and uh, and that's uh, I drew on that a lot. Right. Mm. So now we get to the PhD and the weevils. <laughs> right. You have well, to tell us about that. Um, I mean, it, I, I have, happen? I have, uh, it, at, at the time I was in graduate school, um, the latest theory of semiconductors was the movement of electrons through semiconductors or holes, which is absence of electron, um, uh, and being governed by the diffusion equation, which is the same equation that uh, governs the distribution of heat, whether it's uh, through the from the sun or in, in a room uh, with warm and cold air or in the clouds or whatever. So um, I had a neighbor who was an entomologist and he was working on alfalfa weevils, having a lot of problems predicting uh, what their densities would be and when you should spray them or not. Oh. And uh, this was in the time of racial caution in Silent Spring where uh, pesticides are frowned upon. but if you didn't spray at the right time, you're going to lose your crop. Um, so uh, through conversations with him, I established that the diffusion equation governed these population densities. So I brought that the diffusion technology into entomology and, uh, and created this successful pest management program in Illinois, which spread <laughs> to other states and other countries. Wow, it's incredible. Now, so really that, that would be my first major innovation. Oh, yeah. That other than computers. First. I had a lot of other small, yeah. small things. That's a pretty interesting <laughs> one. 
Now, of course, most of your career has been in petroleum geo geology, geophysics. I, I, uh, 12 years. 12 years. Oh, well, yeah. that isn't most of it. A, a, good, a good chunk of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, is, is the, the problems you, you, you dealt with there, is that linked to this way you were looking at the weevils? And is it, I'd like to know in more detail, is it, does it link to when you move on to developing something like auto-tune? It's, it, it's, it's all linked together, but it's linked together by the mathematics. Right. The, the, the general mathematical principles being uh, the, 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 con the, the signal processing is, is generally what it's called. Yeah. And more specifically, signal processing in the presence of noise right. disruptions to the data. Right. And you begin to look at uh, the signals are generated with linear systems, and then you're modeling the linear system, and the noise is inputs, and yeah. then your measurements have noise in them too. And uh, it can be complicated, especially when you're trying to steer a ballistic missile off of this kind of data. Then it gets more critical. Right. Yeah, you don't want it to go astray. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did you work on ballistic missiles? Was that something else that you, or was that just an example you brought? Uh, one of my hobbies <laughs> <laughs> is uh, stuff that blows up. <laughs> but the submarine uh, navigation systems uh, was part of that because you can't shoot your missile at some place if you don't know where you're shooting it from. Right, yeah. So yes, we, we, we yeah. worked with that quite a bit. So can you explain in, I know it's a, a complicated technology auto tune, but in simple way, how it works. Because um, thinking of the seismic analogy, I mean, mm -hmm. we can sort of understand. You get this complicated data from a from seism, you know, from say from an earthquake or an explosion, a triggered explosion, mm -hmm. about some of the geological structure, and you've got this cavity here, this throat, and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, is is this this the analogy? Is it like a big hole in the ground or something like that, or? Is there, is there, can you explain in simple terms actually, how AutoTune works actually, is what I'm trying to say. Um, a, a part of AutoTune is exactly that. Right. Um, uh, but let me get to that in a moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah, please, another story. Because you asked me two questions, you know that, right? Yeah. One is how does AutoTune work? Yeah. So if you, if you look at a plot over time of pressure, air pressure, mm. as what, what you detect with a microphone. Right. La. And you, you, you'll see a, a repeated cycle. Yeah. Okay. Um, changing the pitch of a repeated cycle is easy to do, but you have to, uh, the the algorithm. The only algorithm that will run in real time is if you know what the pitch is. Right. Because if you know what the pitch is, you can resample it faster. And then you can repeat it. So you can make many cycles out of a few cycles. Or you can take out cycles and throw them away and stretch the data and, and make fewer cycles, which lowers the pitch. Um, but in order to do th those things flawlessly, you have to know exactly what is the pitch of the cycle right now. So you have to, like, make a new definition for what pitch is. It turns out the definition I chose was pitch is one half of the time that you have exactly one cycle repeated. So a two cycles of data gives you a pitch. So the trick becomes how do I calculate the pitch of those two cycles immediately when they occur? And that's some arithmetic. Right. <laughs> By the way, auditing is nothing fancy when you get down to it. It's multiplying and adding. And uh, that's, um, those are techniques you developed in the petroleum field, then, this, the, mm -hmm. the so-called arithmetic. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. they add, they add Specifically, it uses a technique called autocorrelation, right. which is used extensively in, in the oil industry. Right. Okay. So I'm just standing on the head of giants. I think you'd be modest there, but uh, what was the second question you were going to answer? That I asked you. <laughs> the so thing the, about the throat being a hole in the ground. Oh, right. Aha. Uh -huh. So the, one of the another model from geophysics is what happens to the waveform as it goes down through layers of the Earth. Oh. Okay, 
and it's, each new layer, some of it's reflected back, uh, and and some of it continues down. Mm -hmm. And the reflection coefficient could be could be positive or negative, depending on what the change in density and velocities are. And um, if the layers are somewhat random, in a sense, uh, you can compute the excitation waveform from the data that comes back using an autocorrelation, believe wow. it or not. And, uh, but the, the application to the human voice is uh, you can model the throat the same way. You can separate the throat up into about 50 layers and say that those are discrete shapes uh, or discrete uh, uh, circles, if you will. So you have a throat that's like shaped like this with 50 samples. Why 50? It's a magic number relating to the sample rate of the data. But um, uh, when you do that, you can uh, compute the shape of the throat in real time. Right. And uh, the thing is, when you take a pitch and, say, raise it just by resampling the waveform, pretty quickly you begin to sound like a chipmunk. Yeah. You'll remember so, the chipmunk's records as well. So what my arithmetic does is it computes the shape of your throat and it takes that out of the data. So it makes that pitch now sound like a hiss. Yeah. It's as if I took this, the head of the singer and cut it off right above the vocal cords. Yeah. Then I raise the pitch. Then I put the head back on. <laughs> yeah. Now you've got a singer who can sing up and down an octave or two and you never know it. Fascinating. So um, why do you think auto-tune is described as a controversial technology? I notice even the advertisements for this said there's something about it being a controversial technology. Well, I mean, I personally don't think it is controversial, so I'm curious, what do you think? I'm a nice guy. I, mean, I don't know what kind of controversy there could possibly be. Yeah. But it's different, especially uh, at the face of it when people hear this kind of artificial voice. Yeah. They don't like it. They don't like it because yeah. it's different. But, you know, people didn't like equal-tempered clavaliers. Right. Because it was different. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. People didn't yeah. like six-string six, six string guitars because they were different. We are amazingly conservative. <laughs> um, so, so part of the controversy may be that people think it's somehow cheating. Do you think that's it? That somehow a singer should really just do it and... If they've gained help from a bit of technology, they're cheating. Is that is that? We That's certainly that term has been used quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, what's your attitude re reaction towards that? I would. I was asked that question in a television interview, and I said, "Well, my wife wears makeup. Is that cheating, honey?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, it, actually, it seems ridiculous because we think of the old horns, right? When the, the Edison back in the days. Recording artists had to learn to use those horns in a particular way. They had to sing in a particular style mm -hmm. to, to make that technology work for them. Is that cheating? I don't know. Um, that produced There's, a particular effect with the technology. Before autotune, the primary means for being in tune on a recording mm. is to record take after take after take until you finally get one in tune. Right. And then the, the production engineer would split that sound into the song. Um, uh, what Autotune did for the recording industry was make it really easy for the recording engineer to make a good song because the, the singer comes in and sing it, sings it, it's out of tune, he sends the singer home, uses Autotune for an hour, and now it's perfect. It changed the economics of sound studios completely. Uh, yeah. You can do it much quicker, yeah. Mm -hmm. and save a lot of money, as we know. Mm -hmm. um, can you lose it for live performance? Yes. So, so are, are people actually doing that? So, mm -hmm. when we see a singer live, they may have their voice auto tuned as well. Yes. Is that common? I wouldn't say it's common, but I, it's done. Yes. Yeah, same mm -hmm. technology, basically. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we made a, a hardware box yeah. and sold it, a lot of them. Right. <laughs> so how have m musicians reacted to this incredible technology? Do I mean, do they, do they send a letter, thanks, Andy? <laughs> Because <laughs> you've made a lot of careers. I mean, this technology, I mean, we all know every <laughs> singer virtue here today is using this technology. I had one of the best known producers in the industry approach me at a trade show and he says, Andy, you've changed my life. I don't know what this means. So I said, so I said what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say thank you because he could have meant the opposite, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, great life he, said, totally he said, well, my job, my job used to be listening to tape after tape after tape trying to find a good singer. Oh. He says, now I just find a good looking singer and I use a lot of Soon I'll have a face correction technology as well. <laughs> That's maybe the next thing you can be with. Photoshop. <laughs> yeah. So did you, uh, I mean, have you had much interaction with the recording industry, like, I mean, you go to the NAM trade show, I imagine, and other yes. trade shows, mm -hmm. but do, do, do you go to visit recording studios? Do famous musicians show up and talk to you about the, what they'd like? Not, not so much musicians, but I was in a lot of contact with the producers who would actually be using the product. Right. And they would have suggestions about improvements we could make and so on. Right. We would listen to those. I was hoping you could tell us a story about some famous singer who came and visited you and said, thank you in a big way. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I've had uh, some singers uh, uh, make announcements like that in the press. Yeah, they should do. But, yeah. I mean, it really is a revolutionary technology. But not personally, no. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the questions that we like to ask is, where do you come up with your best ideas? So moving on from Autotune, uh, mm -hmm. any of your inventions, is there a place where you, you know, maybe, I know you're a, you, you, you used to be into yachting, is it on your boat, or is there some place you go where it just, it all comes together, you suddenly realize that this? Uh, no, but I will tell you, interestingly, uh, my, my, I was working from my home when I invented Autotune. Mm. And there was a lot of kids running around all the time. So the only quiet place in the house was my bed. <laughs> so I invented most of Autotune by thinking deeply in bed. <laughs> well, that's an important thing for inventors to know. They must have a comfortable bed. But presumably not so comfortable they fall off to sleep, because that isn't going to work. You've got to be able to right, still keep right, thinking. Right, yeah. You have to stay focused. Yeah. So what skills in general do you say are important for an inventor based on your own? That's a really good question because that's a, it's very important. I mean, this, uh, being successful as an inventor has an economic part. But being creative is important. However, I know, I know many creative people who aren't successful. Um, I was given... Uh, an award by the Society of Exploration Geophysicists for my work at Landmark. And part of that was uh, a gifting to me of a little statue. And the little statue was a cube made out of wire. And on that cube was a teeter-totter, okay? At the long end of the teeter-totter was a little figurine of the thinker. You know, the Rodin? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? And, um, mm -hmm. and uh, at the other end was a big hunk of metal. And the big hunk of metal was inside the cube, and Rodin was outside. The thinker was way, out, way, down the, way outside the box. Yeah. So the metaphor is, if you want to think outside the box... You have to have a big weight in the box. So in my case, the weight is the technology and the signal processing wow. arithmetic and all the things that I had learned from graduate school and undergraduate school and Exxon and other places. So it's, uh, 
if you really know the technology that you can use to enable your ideas, yeah. then your ideas are going to be much more achievable. Right. I said to you as an inventor, it's the, that mathematics, the, you know, the, the, the heavy weight, as you nicely describe it, in the box, that's more important, say, than when you think of something like a Steve Jobs, for him, it was like more the aesthetics of the technology or the, you know. The aesthetics or the functionality. The fun yeah. Is that as important? I mean, would you think that for some inventors, some... Oh, yeah. It, it depends on the, uh, it, you know, having a weight inside the box and say this has to be arithmetic, okay. I mean, it can be structural engineering, it can be uh, social engineering, it can be whatever, uh, yeah. whatever. But there's, if, if I was a beginning inventor, I would make, I would study the area that I'm interested in doing an invention. Right. So I understand right. what all the issues are and what all the other inventions. By the way, if you're a beginning inventor and you want to invent something, while you're doing this study, you're going to find out probably a lot of people have already thought of this and made an invention. Right. Don't be discouraged by that. Most other people's inventions don't work very well. <laughs> <laughs> That's important to yeah. bear in mind. And I, I think we're going to open it to the audience soon, but let me just ask you about the role of failure in invention. Ah. Have you experienced, I mean, your career sounds like a glittering success, but we know behind every success there. Oh, any... no, not at all. Uh, I've had many more failures than successes. Mm. And I, I always important. say only one out of ten of my projects become actually successful. One out of ten? Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so is there a spectacular failure you could briefly describe to us? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'll, t I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one. I just told someone this afternoon is that uh, uh, I was, I worked my way through school. Hmm. And I worked for the, uh, in my graduate studies, I worked for the Department of Long Range Planning at University of Illinois. And these guys filled out these humongous spreadsheets Okay, and uh, I would I would do that, then I would go home and study, and I'd work on this little computer, which is the first 8080 computer called an MSI chassis. I told you, yes. And um, uh, I would, pro in the evening, I'd, or an hour or two, I'd program the MSI chassis, one bit, uh, eight bits per instruction, one instruction at a time. And, uh, and then I'd go to work, and, my boss said, I want you to take one of these spreadsheets and write a computer program, and I want you to have eat one card per cell, and that card can have a formula that addresses other cells and, and adds or subtracts other numbers and, and such like that. And uh, so I programmed a first spreadsheet. <laughs> So they no longer had to fill out all these spreadsheets in such great detail. They just filled out some control numbers and but made the cards with the formulas side. and they had bang out of the, they get their spreadsheet out of the computer. And it was at the University of Illinois in some mm -hmm. administrative mm -hmm. yeah. department, so yeah. it never got out to be Excel or... No, <laughs> it could have. Because I, I was doing the spreadsheet at work and the microcomputer at home and I never put the two ideas together. Wow. I, that's a failure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Big time, yeah. Well, uh, well, so what would you, one last question, then we'll, we really will throw What would you like to invent in the future? Is there something that's... I'm working on it. Can, yeah. you, tell, can you share it with us? I promise, we promise yeah, we sure. to steal it. <laughs> no. Uh, I, I'm applying my signal processing mm. to stock prices. Oh. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, I'll have a word with you afterwards about this. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah. Well, if that's successful. It's, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's throw it open and see. Uh, we've got questions from the floor. We have a hand right at the back there. Yeah, you, sir. I have a question. Yes, yes. Does, how does AutoTune know? what the frequency should be. Does it predict, or do you already tell it in advance what it should be? That's a good question. Um, 
in the automatic mode, you tell it what key and what scale. So you can have minor scale in, in B flat, okay? And then it will listen to your pitch and it will tune you to the note close, it will tune you to the scale note that's closest to your pitch. So um, uh, an artifact of that is if you're more than a, a pitch off, a half a pitch off, it'll tune you to the wrong pitch. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to be good enough to be fairly close, but you don't have to be perfect. Okay, there was a question there. Yeah, you sir, yeah. Um, my question is two part. Um, Oh, I hate these. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. Go ahead. <laughs> um, as, as a teacher, um, the first part is I teach a lot of students that have kind of lost their joy of learning by the time I get them in high school. Mm -hmm. And with your diagnosis at, with ADHD, um, you know, a lot of kids come with a heavy weight about this and that. How, how would you suggest to design a class that could take the, what they perceive as a disadvantage and use that as a spark for your creativity to go forward. Mm -hmm. And the other part to the question is, what kind of special things could I do to inspire more students of color to get into more fields of technology to be able to um, create ideas and things of mm -hmm. that nature? Mm -hmm. Do I get paid for this one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you need to recontextualize what it means to design a class for an ADHD to be successful. Um, because intrinsically, they won't, they won't do very well in, the classroom mode, in a classroom environment until they really get motivated about what they're doing. Um, so if you're teaching a physics class, you might give that student something that he could connect with in, in his life in terms of some science related to the physics. Um, or you might do it through some other thing he has an interest in, an interest in, like uh, maybe this physics student has an interest in mathematics, or maybe music, or whatever gets them motivated. And the problem, I think, is um, these kids often, that's hard to identify. Um, what got me in, involved in sciences was, was a book that was actually above my grade level, even though I wasn't very good at reading. And it was about just uh, general science, uh, written for kids, and uh, experiments you could do at home. Um, some of that involved blowing things up. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I probably an ADHD kid would love to blow things up, <laughs> right? Uh, they had a TV program called uh, Mythbusters, and they love to blow things up. They're all ADHDs, okay? <laughs> um, so you need a hook. It's something that the kid is interested in. They might need not even know what. What are you interested in? I don't know. No, there's no skills to communicate, right? But talk to their parents. What is this kid? What does he do? Oh, he plays this TV game. About what? Motorcycles. Motorcycles. Get the kid a, a book on motorcycles and see if they can hook into it. Okay. Um, about color. I would like to expand that to be about color and women. Um, all, all the way through my undergraduate, I, I grad, I, I, my undergraduate, I started with 5,000 other engineers, and we ended up being a class of 500 engineers. None of them were women or blacks. And um, uh, in my graduate work, I started out with about 2,000 uh, entry-level master's students, and uh, we graduated about 300. We had some Asians, no women, and no blacks. What can you do? I mean, you can, you can mandate universities to include blacks. Are you talking about a grade school environment or a college? Make them all. Okay. 
I, I know I know in the in the area of law, some law schools that to get government funding, you had to admit X percent of blacks. So they would they would bring blacks into the program, but the blacks were not sufficiently educated uh, to be on the same playing field as the other students. Um, and so they wouldn't be successful. Um, I don't know what the issues are about blacks. Uh, I do know what some of the issues are about women. They're not socialized towards numbers to begin with. Um, uh, but to bring to, to uh, if, if I were you having this problem, I would research what what connects blacks into the educational system and try to generalize that into the specific uh, science programs or math programs. Maybe someone here can answer this question better than me. Any ideas? I think it's a uh, topic we're all wrestling with, and if, we, if there was an easy answer, we'd be trying to implement it. I think it's a very complex, difficult issue. I know with women it's about expectations and training, starting when they're little little kids. And uh, uh, with blacks, I mean, it may be that they don't understand the, their potential. So, well, there, uh, there's a, a program, and there was a, a, a show called The Wonder Years. Remember that that show, The Wonder Years? And the girl, I forget her name, uh, on that show. Yes. Great example. So there's a gentleman there. The um, blue real quick, could you just repeat what she said, just so we can get it on the recording? What? Give her a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure I know this show, Winnie. So uh, uh, it was called uh, the Wonder Years. The Wonder Years. Yes, and of course, a lot of kids watch this show. They love this show. These kids are all grown up now, and they, and a lot of them have become very, very successful. But there was a girl on the show that young girls could identify, but it just so happens that she was very good in math and science. So it really introduced a lot of girls into you know math and science because they identified with her, they loved her, and she made it look like something, well, they could do it too. So, mm -hmm. you know, just yeah. identifying with Role models and mentors Role models. and examples Absolutely. are obviously you know, crucial. People that they look up to. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what? Yeah. Yeah. Gentleman there, the blue tie. Uh. Uh, well, thank you for, for, for trying to tackle an enormous question. Yeah. Much harder than trying to uh, fix the pitch of pretty singers' voices. So, um, but the question does relate to the issue of mentorship, uh, collaboration. And so often, you know, the inventor is portrayed as a lonely inventor. You're description of that award, you know, sitting off by yourself or maybe lying on your bed. Um, and a lot of times, not all the time, invention requires, as you say, standing on the shoulders of giants, being influenced by other people. And I wonder if you could identify some of the key figures, mentors, thinkers, collaborators that helped you or perhaps taught you something you didn't know before or perhaps told you that you could, in fact, do this, that made a difference in not necessarily the completion of the project, but maybe the beginning of the project, or maybe the root of what you've done in your career, which is moving between different fields of knowledge and using mathematics and certain concepts to link fields, otherwise don't talk to each other. Geophysics and math, it's not a usual, you know, and, 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 and music is not a usual combination. So who helped you along the way? Who do you, would, you, would you give some credits to? In um, I'll, get, I'll get to the answer, but I'm going to weave around a little bit. Because, I hope you do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you go to your, pick a university, walk into their 
into their symphony orchestra rehearsal. Ask everyone there to raise their hand if they're in engineering or mathematics. And half that orchestra will raise their hand. Why is that? I believe it's that music and mathematics have a common denominator. And that's symbolic abstraction. Um, so there is a skill, that's part of the skill set of becoming an engineer or mathematician, is the ability to s represent things symbolically and man manipulate the symbolic relationships and therefore come out with a solution, say, to a problem. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but for me, I would say if I had to pin down a single mentor, it would be a man who died... Uh, uh, when I was young, I died in 1953, Norbert Wiener. He's often called this the father of signal processing. And of cybernetics as well, yeah. Yes, he was very broadly based. Yeah. And um, he invented a lot of the mathematics that I take from one discipline to another. Um, another thing is, you're absolutely right, I've introduced technologies I've learned in one area into another area, introduced technologies from semiconductor theory into insect population density estimation. And I've taken, by the way, that was very popular, and you can now synthesize what the insect population density is going to be two or three months from now and decide when to spray, and, uh, and it's... it's it all works very well nowadays. But anyway, um, uh, and I also took uh, uh, science from, from uh, seismic data processing into music. And um, I didn't really invent a lot of stuff. I just implemented things with some creativity. It's interesting, that's what Robert Moog used to say as well. He didn't invent a lot of stuff. He Im implemented stuff, oh, tools, really? tools that were given to him by other people. Mm -hmm. He saw how to apply those tools. Mm -hmm. That's a, a, a lady there. Has a, this way. Yeah. More questions? Come on, y'all. Yeah, there, there's Challenge. plenty out there. There's plenty. <laughs> Don't worry, we've got I know list. you. <laughs> You've had your turn. <laughs> I have a question about, a comment and a question about auto-tune. Where are you? I'm right here. She's there. Ah. I guess maybe I'm very either too trusting or, or naive. I, I always wondered how singers sound not so great when they're giving a live performance. Like, I've listened to that album or CD, and they sounded so great, and why do they stink when they're actually on the stage? Not all, but many, and mm -hmm. now I know, know why. Yeah. Um, I have a, my question is, I have a magnet on my refrigerator that says, sing as if no one can hear you, and that's me. I, I'm Florence Foster Jenkins. You don't want to listen to me, but I still <laughs> belt out, you know, in the car at night. I like to drive at night because no one can see me singing. Um, as a, as a layperson, is there um, a, a, a popular version of autotune? Can I go some, I would love to know what I sound like <laughs> singing well, there, on there, pitch. <laughs> is there there is a I version on the iPhone. Really? Yes. And, uh, and, and uh, other than that, um, there, there is uh, computer programs called digital audio workstations, which is like a synthetic mixing board on your computer. And autotune is typically used in those programs as what's called a plug-in. But all that gets to be pretty expensive pretty quick. We had some... Uh yeah, last one. The gentleman, the blue shirt, uh, there, yeah. So lots of people invent things. How did you learn to commercialize them successfully? I was hungry. <laughs> Not that easy. <laughs> Does that answer your question? I can give you more words, but... Yeah, translate the hunger into the, the details a little more, maybe. Uh, <laughs> I got to be careful <laughs> what I'm going to say. Uh. <laughs> My wife is looking. 
is she the person who commercializes it? <laughs> Actually, she's the person who ran the company and made all the money. So it's, yeah, yeah I'm, uh, right. yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, are we done? I think we're done in terms okay, of Okay, great. <laughs> I, think, I, I think actually giving credit to your wife is a wonderful point to end on. So um, <laughs> it's actually very nice. So just, just a couple things in closing. Um, first off, I really want to thank uh, several of my colleagues uh, who really helped make tonight possible. So Will Reynolds, Laura Havel, Katie Mako, and Dan Holm, who you'll see kind of around the space. So really appreciate their hard work. Um, the second thing is there are, in fact, some distinctly national treasures on display tonight. So before you go out to the reception, have food and drink, or have food and drink, but don't carry it over to this table. Um, my colleague is over here with some real remarkable pieces out of our history, including from Volta Laboratories, which is where Alexander Graham Bell did his earliest work. And so we have some of the very earliest sound recordings um, in, in history on display for you to take a look at um, that really don't often come out of storage. So please take an opportunity to do that. Talk to my colleague, Carlene. And with that, let me really thank both Trevor Pinch and Andy Hildebrand. What a wonderful conversation, great insights, and uh, thank you so much for doing this.